Welcome everyone to the Missouri Association for College Admission Counseling Virtual College Fair. This is the College Planning 101 panel presentation. Before I kick it off to our presenters, a few housekeeping items. Your camera and microphone are off, so you are muted and your video is off, um, so the panelists cannot see or hear you. So the best way to communicate with them is through the Q&A tool. So feel free to type your questions at any time and the presenters will do their best um, to get to you throughout the presentation. This is just one of many sessions um, for today and tomorrow. Um, so feel free to sign up for more sessions at strivescan.com slash Missouri. And this session is being recorded. So you are able to view this in an on-demand setting later after the fact. Um, so I will pass it over to uh, Jamie Sachs, who will get this thing started. Take it away, Jamie. Thank you very much, Jen. And welcome everyone. We are very excited to have you joining us this evening. As she mentioned, this session is called College Planning 101. And we hope that the answers that we share tonight are helpful to you and it is being recorded so you can go back and watch it later if you like. Now we realize that trying to determine which colleges best match your goals, your personality, academic profile and budget, it can be exciting on some days and other days it can be overwhelming. So during this session, we're going to answer a series of questions that we often hear from students who are going through this college search process. And we think that'll help you too, as you're going through it yourself. So we have assembled a knowledgeable group of panel, panel members, and they're excited to share their advice and recommendations with you. And we are more than happy to answer questions you have so don't hesitate to use that Q&A function and we will get to as many as we possibly can. So at this time, I want to introduce you to the panel and I'll kick it off. Uh, my name is Jamie Staggs and I am a regional admissions counselor for the University of Memphis. And I live in the Metro St. Louis area. I've been an admissions counselor for over 22 years. So I've worked at University of Central Arkansas, Western Illinois University, and now University of Memphis. And it is my pleasure to serve as your host tonight. Hi everybody, my name is Steve Held and I serve as the Regional Recruitment Specialist uh, for the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Um, this is year 29 for me in higher education. So I'm getting close to the old 3-0. I've worked in a lot of areas with admissions, including financial aid. Uh, I've worked, I was at St. Louis University for nearly a decade. I worked at SIUE. Um, I think that this is awesome that you've been able to join us. Um, I, like Jamie, actually live and work from my home in the greater St. Louis area. So mo work with most students from the state of Missouri that apply to the University of Nebraska. Happy you guys are aboard tonight, thanks. Hello everyone, so happy you could join us this evening. My name is Tamika Heron and I am the Director of College Planning for Southeast Missouri State University. And um, I am located in St. Louis, I'm based in St. Louis, so also work from home. And I started my, I think my career with this about 17 years ago. And so since then I've done admissions work, financial aid work um, and all things college planning. So. Um, I am looking so forward to getting into the thick of things and answering these questions for you. Um, if you have any questions, like Jamie said, please feel free to put it in the chat and looking forward to engaging. Hi everyone, my name is Abby Jelovich. I am zooming in tonight from Kansas City, Missouri. I am a college counselor at St. Teresa's Academy. Um, prior to St. Teresa's, I worked in college admissions for about a decade. Um, I worked at Missouri S&T, Oregon State University, the University of San Francisco, Cal State East Bay, and Rockhurst University. Um, and I'm really looking forward to chatting with you tonight about College 101. Hi, everyone. My name is Chat Leonard. Uh, I was formerly the director of college uh, counseling at Metro Academic and Classical High School. That's always a mouthful, right down the street from St. Louis University. I've 
been a high school counselor for over 35 years, uh, but this past summer I transitioned and now I am doing independent counseling and college consulting. Glad to be here. Perfect. Well, now what we want to do is transition into the Q&A session because we're going to ask this knowledgeable panel a series of questions and let them share your, their advice with you. And I bet many of you have the same questions that we're gonna cover. So without further ado, the first question that we're hearing a lot these days is should students take the ACT or SAT? Since many colleges are now saying they don't require it for admission and in some cases scholarships too. Abby, would you like to answer this for the group? Yeah, thanks, Jamie. Um, yeah, it, it is really the talk of college admissions now is, is standardized testing to test or not, to submit scores or not. Um, for folks on the panel, you may get a, a variety of different answers. I think that um, because colleges and universities in the United States, but also across the world have not uniformly adopted test optional policies or test blind policies, um, and because some institutions may not require for admission, but may for scholarships or um, may require a test score to get into a specialized major or a specialized honors program or may um, still be using test scores for things like course placement um, in terms of your initial enrollment at an institution. Um, my answer right now is I probably would yes test um, for as long as institutions um, are in terms of some institutions still requiring scores or using them in some fashion. Um, it gives you the option to use it if you end up needing it for something. Um, and alternatively, some students do test really well and testing is an asset. And for those that are, um, it is a great thing to have um, as you're deciding to submit or not. And finally, um, we may have folks of different age ranges on this call in terms of what year you currently are in high school. Um, and again, going back to you know, colleges having different policies regarding test optional admission, um, some have made decisions for this class of 20, 2022, but haven't yet decided you know, what they're doing for future classes. So again, until um, you know, everyone all over the country kind of has the same policies um, about testing or not, I would, I would encourage students to test at least once um, so that you've got that if you end up needing it for a specific school or scholarship or specialized program. Thank you, Abby. Um, that was great advice and you shared many good reasons uh, for your answer, thank you. Another question we often get is if a student has only three to four hours to spend on a college campus, what is the best use of their time to help determine if it's the right fit for them? Tamika, could you give us some guidance on that? Definitely. You know, three to four, you can get quite a bit accomplished in three to four hours um, on a college campus. But I, I would say that during that time, a student should spend those three to four hours trying to see if they can see themselves on that college campus for the next four years. Um, I always suggest the students to create sort of like a, a college um, profile, which lays out what you as a student want and need in your college experience, as far as majors, class size, extracurriculars. Um, but specifically some things, um, I would say definitely meet with the admissions reps, um, meet with student ambassadors, but then also talk with um, regular students, um, if you can sit in on a class, do that. I encourage students to visit the campus resource centers so you'll know what kind of support is there when you're on campus. Definitely tour the campus, um, visit the dorms, try the food. Um, if you can attend an event and then also because the, the campus isn't in the, you know, it's not an island. So I would definitely say explore the town as well. Great advice. Um, yeah, those campus tours tell you so much, you know, the feel, the vibe of the campus and the city and the community. 
So students make the most of the time that you have for sure. Uh, another question that we often get, this is a toughie, uh, with thousands of colleges in the United States, how does a student go about finding their perfect school? Chat, are you willing to take this one? That's a really interesting question, Jamie. Hmm, the perfect school. Uh, personally, I don't think the perfect school actually exists unless it's uh, in your mind or your perception, because uh, we as people, uh, we're not perfect, and the college search process is not perfect because you're constantly changing your needs, your interests. Uh, if you're a junior, uh, first semester, what you think is a perfect college for you based upon your interests and your skill set and uh, your desires, you know, that could definitely change uh, by the end of the school year, especially after you've had a couple of campus visits. And then uh, when you start applying to colleges uh, in the fall of your senior year, and also ultimately when you make your final decision, which is typically the second semester of, of your senior year, uh, you know, that whole thought uh, um, uh, range could change based upon what you think that you want. Uh, when I work with students who are looking for that perfect college, they usually fall into two categories. One category is the checklister. And this student has a, a, a checklist of 10 criteria or maybe more uh, that they need to have in a college. And if that college doesn't make all 10 of those criteria, well, guess what? That college is off that list. And don't laugh because you probably have friends who are checklisters. And matter of fact, you're probably a checklister yourself because you're attending College Planning 101. Hmm, I can check that off my list. So my advice is that, you know, uh, 10 criteria, that's fine, but you probably would want to think about uh, narrowing that down to the most important four or five. And then, you know, the other five through 10 could be, uh, you know, the one that are not as important, it would be nice to have, but it's not as important. In my opinion, if um, a college makes six out of 10 criteria, that ain't bad at all. The other student I work with, uh, and uh, they're looking for that perfect college, uh, is a student who is hyper-focused or hyper-fixated on that one perfect school. And I have been thinking about this school for years. And if I don't get into this school, it's all over. I don't know what I'll do. And my advice to that student is that, yes, it's okay to have a dream school. It's okay to have one or two dream schools, but I wouldn't want uh, uh, you to put your eggs in that, you know, proverbially one basket, because if you do, uh, you may be setting yourself up for disappointment, especially if that school is super competitive. Um, my advice to students is that, you know, I like a third, a third, a third formula. That means that if you're applying to six colleges, you know, two of your colleges are safety schools, and these are likely schools based upon your academic uh, profile, you'll probably get in. And then uh, two maybe mid-range schools, and that means that uh, probably you will get into those schools and, and they're really a good fit for you. And then a couple of schools can be your reach or your dream school. So as long as you have a balanced list, it's perfectly okay to have one or two dream schools, but not just one school that you know, you've got to get into. Thank you for that great advice, chat. I had to laugh when she was talking about the checklist student. I bet there's some parents watching that are checklist parents too. And I'm one of them as well because I have a senior in high school too. Thank you for that great advice. Um, another question where he, we hear quite a bit is how many colleges should a student apply to? And chat touched on that a little bit. Steve, would you like to share a little more advice when it comes to that? Sure, and I'm glad I'm following chat on this um, because to say it depends sounds like I'm going to escape the question wholly, um, but at the same time, narrowing that process for some students, as chat alluded to, who are hyper-focused, this number is probably not a, a bad number to come to whether that's two or whether that's four or whether that's six. 
I think that there's there's a there's a cap. I think there, there comes a point where there's too much, um, and also, you know, how organized are you willing to be? Um, I think I'll, I think I get a chance to talk about that in a little while. But for me, as a parent, and I have two college kids myself, to to make a realistic list, um, to have to be able to organize yourself because there, there are things like the common app and the internet makes it very easy to apply to multiple schools. Um, but ultimately one of the questions I asked answered today during a high school visit was, you know, if you ever heard of a thing called a throwaway application and I said, you know, that worries me because if you're just applying to apply there, there's no real reason to do that. Um, so for me, I think for most students, anywhere between five and eight, um, 10 in some cases, uh, we out in the admissions world, we love applications. So of course we wanna have as many applications for the University of Nebraska as possible. Um, I do respect greatly the folks who are on the other side of the desk, the high school counselors who, and college counselors who have a class of maybe 600 as seniors, and if all of those kids are applying to 10 schools, do the math. So in the end, for me, it's, it's about perspective and to narrow that list from a visit, interacting with the school and having enough choices ultimately that could be financially right, fit that feel right for you, um, really is my best advice when it comes to the number of schools you apply to. Thank you, Steve. And you're right, I know some students apply to one school that doesn't give them many options. And then I've met some students who apply to 30 and they are overwhelmed just trying to stay in touch and on top of their mega list. So I, I feel like that was great advice. Another question we want to answer for you is what are the differences in college applications? Because there are a lot of different types of applications out there. And this is something you'll experience when you go to apply. So I would love for Abby to share some guidance with you about that, the types of college applications. Thanks, Jamie. Yeah, and I think specifically, I'm going to be addressing the different types of application plans you can choose from. Um, you know, not only are you thinking about what schools are you going to apply to, um, but then you're going to drill down into what application are you using, meaning are you using the Common App, that school's institutional application, and or the, com the coalition application, depending on what combination of application platforms that school offers. And then you next need to drill down into um, what application plan you're choosing to apply via. And um, there are many different application plans. Some schools only have one, some have multiple. And so understanding what all of those mean um, you know, is really important. So at a high level, um, you know, first type to think about is an early decision application. Um, these tend to be more common with selective or highly selective institutions. Um, early decision is when you are applying to a school uh, via a binding application, meaning that um, if you are admitted to that institution, you are going to go and withdraw all your other applications. It's actually a contractual process that you, your parent and your, your college counselor will sign off, off, sign off on if you submit an early decision application um, because it essentially um, makes sure that all parties understand that again, that it's binding. And the reason to apply early decision, which I would say that most students across the country do not apply early decision, um, but if you apply early decision, it's because there's one school that you are just so jazzed about that it's the school for you. And essentially what you're saying is, hey, school, I'm so excited about you that if you admit me, I'm going to be there. And it doesn't matter who else is admitting me. Um, so that's a really important thing to think about. And again, if there's not that one school for you, then early decision um, is not a good choice. It's also really important when you apply early decision um, that you have run the financial numbers with your family because that also involves um, making a commitment to the school um, without 
ahead of application necessarily knowing um, exactly what that financial aid package is going to look like. So doing that net price calculator is important. So again, early decision is binding. You can apply early decision to one school. And if you're admitted, you do have to go. Um, next, early action. That is where you are applying early, um, typically in October or November, November depending on the school. Um, and you typically find out early, um, but you are not required to go. Um, so the pros of early action, or the pro of early action, again, is that you apply early and you find out early. Um, but again, there is no commitment on your part to go. You can apply to as many early action schools as you would like. Um, for both early action and early decision, you are essentially applying with your um, transcript through six semesters. Um, so again, if you've been a really, really solid student um, through six semesters or through your junior year, then those early plans are good because again, you've been consistent and you find out early and you can start getting some feedback and whittling down your list or conversely, you can decide to add some schools. Um, so those are things to think about with those early applications. Um, next, there are regular decision schools. This can mean a couple different things. Sometimes schools just have one regular deadline. You apply by the deadline and then they release decisions after that fact. Some schools have both um, an early round and a regular round. And a lot of times when that's the case, they'll have a early round in October or, or November and then a regular round um, in January or February. Um, you know, if you're not ready to apply early, then you can definitely look at those regular rounds. Um, or perhaps you're somebody that you had a kind of a rocky junior year and you would like to, you feel like senior year um, is really going well academically, then give yourself the seventh semester um, to, to let your transcript tell the story of kind of that rebound or having some positive success uh, before being reviewed. Um, now, again, when you're thinking about selective admissions, um, a lot of times there can be um, higher acceptance rates in early rounds compared to regular rounds. So that's another thing to think about with your, your counselors as you're working through this process. Um, I think I skipped restrictive early action. This is pretty rare. Just a, a few schools in the country have it. Um, that's where you are essentially uh, applying to one school restrictive. So you can't apply restrictive early action and early decision somewhere. But the, the big difference between restrictive early action and early decision is that if you um, are admitted via restrictive early action, you do not have to go. So it's it's not a binding commitment, but you are still telling the school that, hey, you're my number one choice. Um, and then ruling um, is really, I think, the last application plan to talk about. And that is essentially where um, schools are taking applications through the course of the academic year, um, typically over the summer as well, um, and kicking out decisions um, over the course of the year too. So there's not like a firm deadline that you have to apply by, um, but you've really got um, kind of the whole year at your disposal to apply, but then also get decisions back um, from those institutions. And that I think in a nutshell um, are all of the different application plans that you can think about. So again, as you, you know, start to do research and start to organize and make spreadsheets about um, the schools that you're gonna apply to, it's, it's the schools, it's the type of application, it's their deadline, and it's also the application plan that you're gonna pick. Thank you, Abby. And as our audience could hear, there's a lot of details. And that's part of the reason we mentioned it's recorded. So you can access this later and be like, okay, what did she say? Um, so we hope that helps you quite a bit. We are starting to get several questions from our audience. So I'm gonna go ahead and address one of those that you submitted. And Tamika, I'm going to see if you can start, kick us off on this one. But it's, what are some scholarships that most people wouldn't believe there are scholarships for? So if you want to share a few thoughts, and then if any of the other panel members want to, please feel free. You know, there are scholarships for just about everything. Um, prior to this position, I managed scholarship funds at the um, Community Foundation. And one scholarship was for immigrant student, students going into STEM fields who had um, experience with a music program. <laughs> I mean, and that's very specific, but there are literally scholarships for everything, um, for being a left-handed student, 
for um, having an incarcerated parent for um, just, just about everything. So um, my advice is to use scholarship match sites. Um, and typically the way those work is you complete a, a, a application which just has general questions about, about the student and they will match you to scholarships to which you may be eligible. And so it kind of, it hits all of those different, those different areas, those unique areas, because literally they are for everything, having blue eyes, having hazel eyes, having brown eyes, having hair past, you know, your sh long hair or they're literally for everything. But um, match sites work, work really well. And I'll actually put some into the chat too. Perfect, that sounds good. And you're right, a lot of times the donors for these scholarships, they choose the criteria. And so they can be as specific as they want to be. Um, so we wish you well with your scholarship search. We often recommend that you not pay for it because there are so many great scholarship, scholarship searches that are free. Um, so I know we'll share some resources with you on that. Um, there is another question I want to go ahead and address that came in uh, from the students. And Steve, if you would mind commenting on this, that would be great. It's, do you think taking core classes in community at a community college would be good? And then going to a college for your major or minor. So if you want to kind of share your perspective, that would be good. And then again, panel, I'll open it up to any following comments. I think it's a great idea. It's going to depend a little bit on your major. Um, we in, the, in higher education, we use a, a term that's called articulation. So many colleges and universities in the state of Missouri and in Illinois for that matter, have articulation agreements. And so if you were to pick one of the major state universities in the state of Missouri, most of them are going to have an articulation agreement with the community college. So you could pretty closely follow the academic program in your, especially with your general education classes, that maybe you're an A plus student in the state of Missouri. And maybe that means you go to free community college. Uh, there are definitely some big advantages to doing that. Um, do a little work. Again, the word is articulation. Um, and especially if you're thinking that you know what your destination for your college or university is, you can work backward and then work with your community college. Um, I think it's a great idea. One, it can save you some money. Two, if you're A plus, absolutely will save you money. And three, there's also no reason why you might not wanna do that right now. Uh, many of you live in uh, school districts that are associated with or joined with a community college, and you could start some of that right now. Thank you, Steve. I have this next question, and it is what strategies do you recommend students use to narrow down their list of potential, but what strategies? Okay, um, I think I can um, answer, respond to that. Oh, I could probably uh, talk uh, 30 minutes on this, but um, we don't have that much time. And, uh, you know, students ask, oh, there are so many colleges out there. Where do I start? And so for the sake of time, I would say start with the basics. Uh, think about, you know, what you want in a college and a college experience. But I tell my juniors, uh, think about, uh, size, location, major programs, admission requirements, and costs, but not necessarily in that order. It just depends upon who you are and what's most important to you. So when you think about the size of the school, uh, we're not talking about acreage. We're talking about the undergraduate population. So uh, for Mizzou, you know, they're a large school, uh, 24,000. But if you add in the med school, the law school, the veterinarian school, of course, it would be a, a, a much larger. We're talking about undergraduate population. So think about a size that's right for you. Um, usually uh, 3,000 or less, uh, that's considered a small school. 
So Rockhurst University in Kansas City, Drury, um, Drury University in the southwest part of the, um, uh, uh, of the state, uh, Webster, Fontbonne, those are all small schools, medium-sized schools like Truman or uh, UMKC or WashU, uh, large schools like uh, Southeast Missouri State, the University of Memphis, uh, Mizzou, those, those are large schools, usually um, over 8,000, medium-sized schools, 48,000. And just think about the kind of experience you want. If you wanna go to football games and basketball games and you're gonna have thousands of students and the Greek system is alive and well and you've got a bazillion courses to choose from, then a large school might be better for you. Um, however, let's say that you're a, a second semester freshman and you think you're gonna be a psychology major and uh, you sit in your professor's psychology class and um, you know that uh, next year you'll be taking some more classes from this professor and you would like to be a research assistant and uh, that probably would happen in your first semester of your sophomore year, probably more at a smaller school than a larger school. I'm not saying it couldn't happen at a larger school. You just may have to be more proactive. So one is not better than the other. It's just what's right for you. Think about location. And this is the time to have the dialogue with your parents about, you know, can you go out of state? Uh, how far away from home are you able to go? And uh, so since your parents are, you know, uh, they definitely have a, a stake in this, have, have those conversations with your parents. Uh, think about major programs. And we're talking about your majors, what you wanna study. And as juniors and seniors, you may think you might know what you wanna study, but one of the most popular majors would be 999, and that's undecided. And it is perfectly okay to uh, attend college undecided because so many students change their majors anyway. But start thinking about your interests, start thinking about career interests, start thinking about your skill set, and make sure that the schools that you uh, choose to apply to would have a, a variety of those majors that you're interested in. But remember, uh, you don't have to declare your major um, uh, to choose a school. And most colleges, you won't have to even declare your major until second semester of your sophomore year. There are some programs like engineering or architecture, you may have to uh, apply to those schools while you're in high, uh, those uh, majors while you're in high school, but you're not stuck in them. Uh, think about uh, admission requirements. Um, does my academic profile match the academic or is it comparable to uh, the schools I'm applying to? And going back to my previous responses, you know, a balanced list of having some safety or likely schools, some good fit or mid-range schools and a couple of, of reach schools. So, you know, we don't want you to say, oh, well, gee, I don't have the test scores or I don't have the GPA, so I won't get into this school, I, I won't apply, but uh, we just want you to make sure that you have a, a balanced list. And then finally, cost. I think my colleagues on the high school and the college side would say, we don't want uh, you applying to a, a college or not to apply to a college to be a barrier because there are so, um, so much financial aid uh, available. Like Tamika said, uh, merit-based aid, uh, based upon grades or or um, music ability or, or debate or or even sports and then need based aid. So we want you to apply to the school, uh, then apply for financial aid. And I know a lot of colleges out there are really trying uh, really hard to make it work for you to be able to matriculate. So size, location, major programs, admissibility, and cost. Thank you, chat. That is worth listening to again. Um, we had a couple of questions come in that I'll answer quickly, but also welcome the panel to add to. One question is, would colleges accept students with a 3.0 or below? And the answer is yes. There are certain colleges whom will consider a GPA below that for you to be admissible. Um, sometimes we'd like to see an ACT or SAT score, Sometimes that won't even be required. We may ask you a few questions or an essay. There's also open admission to some universities where they don't require you to have a certain GPA or ACT. So the answer to your question is yes, but 
that's not for all colleges. You're gonna have to kind of maybe work with your counselor and those universities you're interested in and ask them, you know, if a GPA at that level or below would still be admissible. I always encourage students to be very transparent with us, tell us what you have, so that way we can give you good advice and accurate advice. Okay. Um, panel, did anybody else want to add to that? Or you want me to go? I'll go to the next question unless you want to jump in. Uh, the next question that we had was about is housing cost included in tuition for any college? Not to my knowledge. Um, usually the housing cost is separate because in most cases, students do often have an opportunity to live on or off campus if they meet certain qualifications. So to my knowledge, it's always separate. And you would wanna look at those two costs individually. Does anybody have a different answer? All right, I agree um, with that answer. I just, I would like to add, you know, when you're thinking about tuition, tuition is the cost um, of your class, you know, because in addition to tuition, you have general fees and then you have room and board and you, then you have textbooks. So um, when you're, when you are reading your financial aid offer letters from the different colleges, you want to make sure you understand exactly what you're looking at. So you have direct costs, which will include the tuition and the fees, um, and then the room and board as a separate cost, because generally you have an option of different resident halls, which will have different prices, and then you have different meal plans, which will cost different prices. But those typically will be categorized as your direct costs, and then you have your indirect costs, which are things like your supplies or personal expenses um, and things like that, which can be different for each student. So um, tuition usually applies just to how much it costs to attend your classes. And so um, like, for example, with Southeast, with our Will to Do Award, it covers tuition and general fees for eligible students. But um, I always explain to students, there's still an expense for room and board. Thank you for clarifying that and expanding upon it. I think we have time for one more question that has been submitted from the audience, and then we want to share some great resources with you. So, Abby, I'm hoping you can address this um, based on the experiences you have with your students. But how long does it take to get a response from an application? And is it at that time that you usually find out your scholarship amounts? So, can you share some advice on that topic? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So it in many ways really depends on the school that you're applying to, but also going back to those application plans um, that can really impact, you know, timing too. So um, I would say typically when you are applying to schools that have, um, you know, rolling admissions where they're taking applications all the way through the entire academic year, um, those can tend to be some of the, the quickest uh, turnarounds. Um, it can be very, very quick in some cases, maybe a little bit longer during uh, peak application season. Um, you know, again, it's, it's not necessarily a one size fit, fits all, but um, for many schools, those early decision and early action applications result in a decision uh, before Christmas, typically. Um, if you apply to a school with a regular decision um, in January or February, um, those decisions can come out, um, you know, anytime from, you know, mid to late February to mid to late March. So um, it really kind of depends on um, the school and their application volume. And then again, which of those, those application plans you chose um, when you were applying. Um, and then there are some schools that do have a, a regular deadline or a priority deadline, but if you apply in front of that deadline, they may get back to you before the deadline. So again, it just depends a little bit. Um, I would say for the vast majority of places that offer merit or academic scholarships, typically that information is in your admission packet or it comes you know, very shortly after. Um, and then schools will, will circle back with your complete financial aid package um, that includes any grants or, or loans or work study that you're eligible for 
um, you know, uh, really any time after they, they have had the opportunity to, to review your financial aid information and process all, although I would say for, for probably the bulk, bulk of schools that is coming after Christmas as well. Um, so again, typically those merit awards are, are in, in the admission letter um, or, or come very shortly after a decision. Great, thank you. So what we'd like to do now is before we part ways to share some resources with you that you can use um, later in your search for your college planning. And so chat, if you can start us off by sharing some of the resources that you think students may find valuable. Well, I love the Barron's Profile of American Colleges. I think it's kind of the Oxford uh, English Dictionary of Colleges. Uh, you can uh, find out about the college, where it's located, uh, the undergraduate uh, uh, population, the majors, the tuition, uh, usually average ACT, SAT scores, so it's uh, very holistic. I love the book of majors by the college board and uh, they've got uh, all kinds of majors, majors you've never even thought about uh, or you ever thought existed. And they're usually in alphabet order by state. And then the Fisk Guide to Colleges. And it's not just um, you know people in admissions talking about colleges, but you're getting the real story from students about you know, their experiences and their classes and their professors and uh, traditions that they have and uh, at the colleges and what to do on campus and off campus. So those are the uh, three resource books that I absolutely love and I would recommend. Abby, are there any resources that you would like to advise our viewers to, um, to access regularly during their college planning? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, the, the, that graphic right in front of, of, your school college counselors and your 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 um, admission representatives um, at the schools that you're excited about um, they are really your resources and your advocates and are here to help you navigate every step of the process um, you know um, whether that is search um, or thinking about um, majors um, to you know helping you navigate, the actual application process um, at the schools that you're excited about. Um, so connecting with your, your school college counselor, um, connecting with college admission representatives um, like the, the folks on this call um, for the schools that you are excited about, um, those are really great folks to tap into um, you know, as you engage on this, on this search. Tamika and Steve, if you can wrap up our session with sharing your resources, that would be fabulous. One that um, I really like is um, petersons.com, and it has a lot of great information about the colleges as far as statistics, um, but not just statistics, things that the college really has to offer. I mean, because You'll get, you'll get great information from the admissions counselor. You can find the information on the website, but when you look at um, places like Peterson's or another one is Cap, um, CapX, and I'll, I'll also put those in the chat. Um, they will give you, they will give you um, very, very accurate statistics and numbers. Um, if you wanna know graduation rates, if you wanna know average class sizes, um, if you want to know how many students matriculate or from freshman year to sophomore year, because those are the kind of kinds of things that you, you want to know. You want to know how many students are successful at that college. Um, but those are two sites that, that I think are great to use. Um, but then I always say nothing is better than actually being on campus, visiting the campus, talking to real life people and asking questions. And my quick hit at the very end is the students who are already at those colleges and universities are by far the best resource that you'll ever have. So if you know someone who went to, I don't know, the University of Nebraska last year, that's the person you should be talking to. What's their experience? What's the positive? What's maybe the negative? 
Um, those are your best resources. We're paid by our colleges and universities to help you and guide you. But ultimately, you're going to be the one who's living possibly on campus and taking classes there. So you should get as direct a contact as you possibly can get. And I would like to say one final thing. A college itself is brick and mortar, but it's the experience that you're looking for. So from uh, the professors whose classes you take, from uh, the people you meet, the relationships and the friendships that you form, uh, these are all important in, um, in defining that college experience. So it's not only where you go, but what you do with what you got once you get there. Well said. Thank you all for joining us this evening. We hope you enjoyed it and found it to be very informative and we wish you the very best uh, with your college planning and search. Great. And I just want to say one more thing before we end the session. Thank you to all our panelists for joining us today. And thank you to all of our attendees as well. When you guys head out, there will be a quick survey. It's about five questions. If you wouldn't mind answering that, we'd really appreciate it. Hearing back from our attendees is how we make improvements. So if you wouldn't mind filling that out, we'd appreciate it. We remind you guys to sign up for more sessions at strivescan.com slash Missouri. And a reminder, as someone said before, this was recorded and will be available at that same website, strivescan.com slash Missouri. Thanks everyone and have a great night.